chat, can you see us as an attendee? Welcome everyone to this session entitled Creating an Inclusive Digital Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Perspectives from Southeast Asia. Um, good morning from Geneva and good afternoon to Southeast Asia. We're very pleased today to welcome a, a panel of uh, um, very uh, um, diverse and interesting perspectives, as you will see. So for now, um, as you will see, you are all muted by default and attendees cannot share their videos, but um, we will encourage you and invite you to, of course, share your comments share your questions with us by using the chat section on the side of uh, the WebEx screen. And uh, there will be an opportunity for us to read and share some of your comments and questions with the speakers during the session. So without further ado, I'm uh, very pleased to give the floor to Mrs. Shamika Sirimane, who will be the moderator of the session today. Enjoy the session. Thank you, Vivi. Um, so, a very big uh, welcome to this virtual policy dialogue. And in fact, it's the first virtual e trade for women masterclass for women digital entrepreneurs from Southeast Asia. So, I'm very happy to be here with you today. And I know that uh, we received, I don't know, close to 90 applications, but we managed, we selected only 18 participants because these are very intensive courses from five countries. Cambodia, Indonesia, Myanmar, and the Philippines, and Vietnam. Uh, and so it shows the great appetite for women empowerment activities. And it also highlights the fact that the women selected are ready to take a role in the digital transformation of the economies. I just want to let you know that the E-Trade for Women initiative started to fill some gaps that we identified in our own work. It is to, we thought that there is a big need to connect inspiring women entrepreneurs in digital space to aspiring women entrepreneurs. And we realized very early on our diagnostic studies that we have done in countries that the e-business skills are a little different from other business skills. So you need a more, lot more uh, training of e-business skills. And then, Extremely importantly, what we also found in our work was that it is extremely important to connect the, the, the entrepreneurs in the digital space with the policymakers, because there's a lot of policy and regulatory frameworks that need to be in place to create an ecosystem. So it is not just the entrepreneurs are ready, but you need to also have an enabling ecosystem for the entrepreneur to, to flourish. So. It is therefore a very big pleasure for me to moderate this session and with this enormous amount of enthusiasm from the women entrepreneurs that we have seen in the region. So we will take up three issues today. Uh, how are women digital entrepreneurs contributing to the digital transformation across the region? And the second, what role can governments and the international community play to support the booming digital industry in Southeast Asia? And then thirdly, we want to hear how can women empowerment efforts such as the E-Trade for Women E-Masterclass can help women to have their voices heard in policymaking processes. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of policy and regulatory frameworks need to be in place to create an ecosystem for e-commerce to flourish. So to lead this interactive discussion, we have the pleasure to welcome, a, a, as Viri mentioned, a rich and diverse panel of speakers. And I'm so very happy to welcome Her Excellency, Ms. Elizabeth Ackerman, Ambassador of the Netherlands to Vietnam, who is joining us from Hanoi and who will deliver the opening remarks. Here, Ambassador, I want to say that Netherlands is our key partner in the E-Trade for Women initiative. So thank you very much for being with us today. And then I have Ms. Julia Ayumon Marsan, Strategy and Partnership Director at the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN. 
and East Asia area, and she will help us set the scene on the role of women in the digital economy in the region. I think, Julia, you will present uh, a state of affairs in the region to us. And then we will move to the panel discussion. And the first panelist is Ms. Elianti Hillman. She's an E-Trade for Women Advocate and, a, and the founder and chairperson of Javara. And she's joining us from Jakarta. And then we have Ms. Vanessa Eragoborvo, and she's the head of the Women and Trade Program at the International Trade Center here in Geneva. And then we have Ms. Su Tet Nin. She's the Assistant Director of the Division for WTO and Trade Related International Organization for the Ministry of Commerce of Myanmar. So this is our policy angle, Sue. We will hear from you. And you, you know, Sue is joining us from uh, Nepido. And we have Ms. Tao Griffith, Policy Advisor to the Chairman of Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And here again, the how the, the, you will talk to us about the networks, the importance of women entrepreneurs networking so that you can make, a, uh, make your voice heard in policy circles. So before starting, let me give you a bit of a logistics here. Uh, so all of you in the audience, please take an active part in this session. You can use the chat function to share your comments or ask a question to the speakers. And before the end of the session, I really will kindly read out a few questions from the audience and we will get a, you know, get a chance for our panel to our expert panel to answer. And then, but you know, I just want to apologize in advance. And if we don't answer all the questions because we have a very limited time for this discussion, but you know, please be connected to us. We will continue this discussion. So without further ado, let us now listen to Her Excellency, Ms. Elizabeth Ackerman, Ambassador of the Netherlands to Vietnam, who will deliver the opening remarks. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shamika, and uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to join you this uh, afternoon here in Hanoi uh, in a forum that uh, bridges Geneva with Southeast Asia and uh, policy with, uh, with practice. Um, we all know that women make half of the world population, but are still the largest untapped reservoir of talent in the world. And it is because of this that the Netherlands uses every opportunity we get, so also today, to underline that investing in women is not only the right thing to do, but also the smart thing to do. And that is also true for supporting female entrepreneurs, empower them to become the entrepreneurs that they can and want to be. And currently a critical challenge for women to thrive in business is the issue of access. Access to finance, access to education, access to land, access to markets. In the current situation where digitalization has become a mega trend uh, as a result of COVID-19, uh, it triggers also the issue of access to digitalization for women. And the digitalization of your business allows for a more efficient operational process and a more effective connection with clients and consumers. And several female tech entrepreneurs even have made it their business to offer digital services to other companies. Digitalization can help achieve the SDGs, accelerate development and create new opportunities to engage in digital trade. And the COVID-19 pandemic shows the, important, the, the particular importance of inclusive digitalization as it underlines how digital literacy and ICT can support trade, increase resilience to economic shocks, and thus benefit women entrepreneurs as well. Therefore, facilitating women's access to digitalization and engagement in digital trade is a strong business case in itself. Meanwhile, women's potential has not been fully uncovered and thus remains underused. According to Grant Thornton, women currently hold only 29% of senior leadership positions globally. In Southeast Asia, that's a bit better. Uh, the percentage is higher, 35%. But then again, mostly 
in positions in human resources and finance instead of also in technical positions. According to the World Economic Forum in 2019, uh, only under a quarter of people in the uh, artificial intelligence digital sector are women. And women are even rarer in positions where decisions are made about digitalization strategies. So room for improvement. And therefore, for the Netherlands, it's a no-brainer to team up for inclusive digitalization and support the E-Trade for Women in initiative, which is meant to inspire, as, uh, as was already mentioned, uh, tech women and support them in capacity building and networking. In Vietnam, the Netherlands is also supporting the launch of the International Trade Center's She Trades Hub. And there are other initiatives out there, financed bilateral and multilateral partners. Let me conclude that for the purpose of women empowerment and female entrepreneurship, either face-to-face -face or via uh, the, digital, the digital road, uh, let's make sure to make an effort together to connect the dots, synergize about amongst relevant program and funds so that resources can be used there to their fullest ex extent and the biggest and most inclusive impact can create it. I wish you a really lively and fruitful discussion today, contributing to a stronger voice of tech women in leading us to a more inclusive local, regional, and global digital economy. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you very much for raising these very pertinent issues. I love that you started saying it is smart economics to have half the world involved in, uh, in, in, in uh, productive activities. And, it, and you've said it's a no brainer that we do not go out and help women to fulfill their potential. I cannot agree more. And as you said, you know, Southeast Asia, I lived in Southeast Asia for almost 11 years of my life. And I know how vibrant women are and how they would take a, a, any opportunity that's been put in front of them to take yeah. it, you know, take things forward. So very, thank you very much. And the last thing that you said was the connecting the dots. And this is a, this is a message to all of us, you know, the international organizations and uh, the, the development partners, because as you said, we do many things and it's extremely important for us to come together because this is a huge field. And there are so many things that needs to be done to create the ecosystem for women to flourish. And thank you. And this is what we do in our E-Trade for All partnership. And it is Netherlands is also a big partner of that. And this is, we are bringing 30 uh, agents, the international agencies, you know, including ITC and the regional banks. So that we come together to do things in countries rather than doing things in the piecemeal manner. So thank you. These are very inspiring words for us to go forward. Glad so now, here. thank you. Now, let me turn to um, Julia now uh, from the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. Julia, you will uh, give us a presentation to capture some of the key trends that characterize the role of women in the, in the ecosystem across the region. And I think this will kind of set the stage for us to take this uh, conversation forward. Julia, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Shamika. Uh, you should be able to see the presentation by now. Correct me if this is not the case, please. Um, yes. Thank you very much again for inviting me uh, to be part of this uh, very interesting conversation today. So many thanks to ANCTAD. I will be talking uh, briefly about us and women in the digital economy. Um, but before starting the real presentation, I will just use a few seconds to tell you what we do at AREA. Uh, as Shamika said, AREA is the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. It's a, in, an international organization that was established a little bit more than 10 years ago. The countries that are part of our family are the ones that you see in uh, this slide, uh, at the bottom of this slide, the 10 ASEAN member states and the so-called plus six. China, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and India. And AREA was established to provide analysis, uh, policy advice to support the process of socioeconomic integration in ASEAN. And we work very much also about the digital economy. 
So to set the real part of the presentation, uh, let's ask ourselves, what is the digital economy? And I copied here a definition that has just been proposed by the OECD to the G20 Digital Economic Task Force with input from many different international organizations, including UNCTAD. And according to this definition, that is actually very broad and shows the extent to which the digital economy is affecting our economies and societies, the digital economy incorporates all economic activity reliant on and enhanced by the use of digital inputs, such as digital technologies, digital infrastructure, digital services, and digital data. And it also refers to many different actors, producers, consumers, including government, that are utilizing these inputs in their economic activities. So again, a very broad definition, and the topics we are discussing today, entrepreneurship, in particular, digitally enabled entrepreneurship and uh, digital trade are very much part of this uh, broader picture. But now let's look at uh, what's happening in the region. We have already heard uh, from both Shamika and the ambassador, a spectacular acceleration towards digital economies across ASEAN. ASEAN is one of the fastest growing digital economies in the world. Uh, the number of digital consumers, for instance, nearly tripled between 2015 and 2018, from 90 million to 250 million. And uh, the pandemic has dramatically accelerated this uh, shift. Uh, depending on the report you want to look at, uh, different estimates are telling us that uh, the transformation that was uh, supposed to take place in three, four, five years is taking place now because so many activities are shifting to digital because we know lockdowns, travel restrictions, uh, uh, social distancing, and many more. Um, so again, this dramatic transformation, a spectacular acceleration. And the same is true when you look also at uh, a country level example, e-commerce is booming in Indonesia, and the same is valid also for uh, most other ASEAN countries. I'm showing data from a analysis that is already old because in ASEAN, uh, you know, uh, things are happening so fast, but the trend is certainly this one. And let me also highlight that it's also a region that uh, is becoming a global leader in the digital transformation. If you look, for instance, at uh, um, characteristics such as uh, the adoption of e-wallets or of digital payment solution, the ASEAN region is well ahead of uh, advanced uh, economies around the world, including in places like Europe or North America. So a spectacular acceleration and a region that is becoming a key global player with respect to the digital transformation. However, this uh, success story is also very much a story of men predominantly in metropolitan areas in ASEAN. There are indications showing that uh, other groups in the population are not equally benefiting from the digital transformation. For instance, women, for instance, people living in rural communities, meaning that if you're a woman in a rural areas, you don't have the same opportunities that uh, you know, your male equivalent in a large metropolitan ASEAN city. And this is very important. Uh, there are also many women entrepreneurs across ASEAN but data also tells us that uh, uh, many of them own and manage micro and small medium enterprises. And we know that these firms, again, of course, there are exceptions, but on average, they have a weaker digital presence and make use of more basic digital tools, if any. So another indication of the fact that uh, women are less likely to, uh, take, uh, uh, to make benefit of the advantages of the digital transformation. And another very important uh, aspect is the fact that women, and this is a global trend, women are more likely to lack so-called digital skills and are generally underrepresented in STEM disciplines. STEM meaning science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. According to a recent Taylor report, for instance, in Thailand, one in four men were studying STEM degrees compared to only one in seven women. And in Indonesia, according to recent GSMA data, 
34% of women compared to only 22% of men were saying that they don't use a mobile phone because they don't know how to use it. So you can see that uh, um, women have less access to so-called digital skills, both when we talk about very basic skills, such as using a mo mobile phone, mobile phone, and also much more sophisticated digital related skills, for instance, studying a STEM degree. So uh, to start my conclusion, because I think my time is coming to the end, uh, there is a spectacular transformation, very fast acceleration toward the digital economy in the region. Uh, but we need to make sure that women, as the ambassador was telling us before, women have access to these opportunities. Many people talk about the digital divide. There is also a digital gender divide that is probably accelerated by the pandemic. So we really need to make sure that uh, this divide uh, is becoming smaller rather than bigger. And the great way to do that is to equip women with access to better digital skills. This is really a key priority for the region. Let me also highlight there's still an important lack of data around the participation of women in the digital economy in the region. So international organizations like mine or UNCTAD and many more, we have, a, we have a job to do to shed more light uh, for a better understanding of this issue to inform uh, policymakers. And again, I, I mean, uh, that was of course prepared before, I will echo again what the ambassador said. Uh, I think women entrepreneurs, especially uh, better connected to the digital economy, are a key building block uh, uh, of the post-pandemic uh, economic recovery plans. Policymakers, uh, different stakeholders, including the business sector, need to pay attention to that. Because this is not only a social imperative, which is of course very important, but it's also a tremendous economic opportunities concerning all of us, irrespective of our gender. So uh, I'm almost done. I just uh, want to show uh, the links to many different reports for those of you who are interested to learn more, some from area, some from other organizations. I won't read them all now, don't worry. Uh, and finally, uh, thank you very much again. You find more information on our website and I really look forward to uh, the discussion uh, today. And now, hopefully, I will be able to stop sharing. Yes, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it was very clear to us. And uh, I'm very happy that you showed us the status, state of affairs in the ASEAN region. And as you said, and also uh, uh, Ambassador highlighted, the women have great potential in e-commerce and the digital economy, not just doing domestic e-commerce, but also when it comes to the cross-border e-commerce. I was, uh, two weeks ago, I was in a similar meeting in South Asia, and the Pakistani minister was telling us uh, that her dream was to have uh, women entrepreneurs from Baluchistan who are making amazing uh, embroidery work, that they are able to do it at home and sell it to the world and capture all the value at, you know, at, the, at, at the producer level. But as you said, the digital divides when it comes to women are huge, and it comes to the connectivity is an issue, and even if you have connectivity, connectivity is, is low or it's extremely expensive to have an internet subscription. And the skills, this is another area where women are lagging. And also the older issues of finance, you know, a young woman walking into a, a traditional bank and asking for a loan to do this thing, e-commerce is not, would not resonate well with the, with the banking sector. So these are all the issues that we need to be aware of and I'm happy that you are in area, you are raising these issues. I think awareness building, uh, informing policymakers of these issues are equally important. So thank you, Julia. So now let me turn to our distinguished panelist and start this panel discussion by discussing the, first we'll start with the role of women in the digital transformation across Southeast Asia. So I'm going to start with uh, Helian T.U. And you as the founder of a business that has turned digital tools as a key factor of growth. So tell us your secret, basically. Uh, when you started this journey, what Absolutely. worked and what didn't work? What factors that you would uh, need to be in place for women to succeed? I think you are the best person 
to answer this question. Thanks, Shamika. Um, hi, everybody. So I think it's a very um, intriguing question, though, because um, actually, um, uh, in 2016, I started to hear more and more people are talking about disruptive economy, how the technology has been disrupting all the business existing business models that are available worldwide. So first I said like, okay, nice to hear. Okay, it's good. Okay, fine. And I at that time I still don't think that it will be affecting much of our business. And then in 2018, uh, I was invited uh, to attend a World Economic Forum in Davos. And their topics, practically everything is about the fourth industrial revolution. So <clears throat> what happened? I felt so intimidated. I completely felt so intimidated during that whole presence um, in the whole events where everybody is talking about it. Everybody's already doing it and putting it into you know scaling up and then all of a sudden oh my god i will be left behind if i don't catch up and then all of a sudden i said like okay yes i have to catch up but where do i start you know how do i start it how um um you know whether do we have a capability to do that where should, where we should uh, what will be the direction that we should go so that's when i started to realize that um I have to understand also the what I'm good at as a, as a founder and entrepreneur, and I have to realize that actually this is not part of my cup of tea. This is, this is not where I'm good at. So I think it's also very important for us to understand, even when you're the owner of the business, but I think you have to understand the limitations that will hinder you from the opportunity and the potential of the company to grow. So that's why in 2019, I decided to remove myself as the CEO of the company um, and, um, and, um, uh, and appointed a CEO that are very senior and he has a 35 years background in the IT industry. Um, so that's where the real digital transformation um, started within our company. So actually it's not too long ago. It was, uh, he started the office in April, 2019. And I think that was one of my biggest nightmare because that's when we realize how unorganized our operation is when you want to reflect it into the digital transformation. Because the first thing that he looked at is data, data, and data. How do we structure our operational data and whether the data is accurate, whether it's capturing every single operation that we have, and whether the data can be recollected to help us make a good decision on our strategy. So that's when I have to uh, behave myself as the major shareholder to make sure that I don't interfere in the transformation because it, it's, a, it's a completely uh, mind changing. Um, it's a, it requires a completely different attitude, uh, different operation system, different uh, rules of the game. Um, so uh, the first thing we did was uh, more on the uh, data management, how to improve our data, because without having a very strong data management, there is no way we can do a digital transformation because data is the core, basically. So um, after that, then we started to um, reflect ourselves in terms of where we are right now. So we hired a consultant to do an audit where we are right now when we want to do a digital transformation when they look into where we are right now it's not only looking into the the data management but they also looking into the hr the human resources that we have because at the end of the day it will be the team that will be going to you know operate the whole transformation and operate the uh, the whole uh, new uh, realm of the business um, and then after that, once we realized that, oh, okay, we don't have enough people that really understand about it. So either you outsource or you recruit and, you know, things like that. And actually it, the digital um, economy actually is requiring a complete different set of skill. Um, so this is something that we have to realize because my business is a food industry. We run a company that, uh, you know, provides organic uh, food products and we export to 24 countries. So it's a very conservative business on its own as the business. 
Um, but in terms of scaling up, we thought we realized that without having a digital transformation, we, our growth will be very slow. We know that. So that's why we keep telling to everybody either we go digital or we go home. Because it's very important for everybody to be on board from the shareholders, from the board, from the team. Everybody has to be realizing the importance of really doing it. And we cannot do it slow because we have to, you know, doing it uh, very quick as a team, not as an individual, but as a team, because uh, the, the organization has to function um, across the board. So basically, that was, a, you know, a piece of the, uh, uh, the, the, the journey. But we're happy that. Uh, within one and a half years, we have achieved so much in terms of we, now we have a very reliable uh, ERP system that we can use as the source of the data management. And now we are moving forward of using the digital platforms to uh, penetrate uh, the market as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Vilianti. Actually, uh for being very humble and for being very open and sh in, in sharing basically your business secrets. I think this is exactly <laughs> why you, we have you as an inspiring leader, because this is the, these are the stories that we, you, we need to, we need to, uh, the, the, the aspiring entrepreneurs need to hear. And thank you very much for, for really telling us the practical, you know, experience of how do you, how did you have to uh, transform your entire analog, you know, you said the conservative, the food industry, f food uh, 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 industry, a uh, firm business into a, a, a totally different business model. And what you, you didn't have skills, you went and took the skills and you're open to these new ideas. And thank you very much for sharing these uh, views with us. And we will come back to you and we are going to pick your brain again. Okay. Uh, so please uh, stay put. So yes, let me now, Vanessa, I'm going to move to you now, because now, you know, I think this is a good place for us to uh, bring ITC and your experience in delivering sheet trade. And how can women entrepreneurs play a catalytic role in the digital transformation? And what have you seen in, in, your, in your own work in, in many countries across the world? Hello, uh, Shamika. Thank you so much for having ITC here today and also for involving us in the E-Trade Initiative. Good morning, uh, everyone on the call. Um, well, you know, I think, you know, when I, when you ask me that question, I think one overwhelming thing that comes to mind is um, diversity. So I think one of the most significant ways is um, women's ability to develop new and better products and services in sectors and in ways that would be overlooked due to a lack of diversity. And we see this lack of diversity in STEM, we see this lack of diversity in research areas, um, you know, and I think women's involvement um, can really address the shocking reality that most product development remains gender blind. Um, so, for example, historically, clinical trials of drugs and treatments have been largely conducted on men. A famous example is uh, the example of testing of seatbelts done on men and not being suitable for pregnant women. Um, so we've seen that technology can really help facilitate the collection of data for use in research at scale and um, cost efficient as well. Um, one of our She Trades Women Entrepreneurs uh, from African, and I think this illustrates my point quite well. This is why I want to use this, this particular example, um, is a woman-owned um, startup business um, that addresses a problem that many black consumers of, of beauty products tend to encounter, and that's a lack of understanding of dark skin. So what she has done is she's applied um, artificial intelligence and machine learning to pictures taken by webcam and smartphone to provide accurate diagnosis and sub subsequently recommend the proper skincare and dermatology products that can actually work. Thus, it, she's using technology to really tap into a blind spot, which the beauty cosmetic industry has um, previously neglected um, and, and demonstrated that greater diversity can really inspire and spur better product um, design. Um, 
you know, listening to the conversation as well, I even want to um, skip ahead really and highlight not just um, how women can play a catalytic role in, in digital transformation, but, you know, a bit what's needed in order to enable them right, Chanika, to, to, to play this role. Um, because as I think Julia mentioned, women are still greatly underrepresented um, in the digital economy and we need to assist them. So number one, I want to focus on this issue of um, increased digital literacy and skills among women entrepreneurs. And in the, as in region, um, the 80% it said of future jobs will require at least basic um, and applied information communication technology skills. So when it, looking at skills specifically, and I we, we go on about skills, but there are a couple of things, specificities I wanted to highlight from our work. Um, taking um, an application oriented approach to capacity building is something that we really do. Helping women entrepreneurs leverage, uh, particularly Instagram, We've seen um, in certain sectors like the textiles and clothing sector, um, Google Analytics, um, WhatsApp, even to improve their online presence. Um, we recently de delivered a five part webinar series on digital transformation to women entrepreneurs, and we wanted to demystify some of the technical jargon, um, you know, data analytics, data strategy, um, so that women entrepreneurs, even without being tech savvy, can make the first step towards adopting um, a data driven business model. And I loved Heliati's presentation around, you know, every business, whether you're tech business, or in any other sector needs to look at adopting um, a data-driven business mo model, as well as um, by demystifying some of this jargon, helping to remove mental barriers to adopting these technologies because they really sound more complex than they actually are. So let me, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. I think this is an extremely important point. I think for the whole demystifying the digital uh, skills, because, you know, with uh, not just the basic skills for using our iPhones, but the next level of skills would get women entrepreneurs going uh, 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 very far. And But you need to demystify because it's just presented as a big wall against which you hit your head or the digital skills. But this, the, the, this targeted skills development that you are doing is so critical. So this is an extremely important point. But another point, I think this is resonating through our discussion, the women not in STEM uh, fields. But let me tell you, I mean, I mean, as I said, I lived in Southeast Asia and, uh, you know, half my family come from uh, Asia. And I tell you, all my nieces, are in, uh, STM, the, in STEM education. I mean, nobody has pushed them, but the one is just graduating as a, a aeronautic engineer. The other one wants to go to do AI. The other one wants to do, I don't know, biomedical fields. So the kids are kids now growing up, maybe in five years down the road, we will see lots of uh, uh, girls huh, graduating from universities with uh, with STEM skills. So this is, a, this is a very hopeful thing for us to us to see. So uh, Vanessa, I'll come back to you. I think these are very important points that you're raising here. So let me now get to uh, Tao. Tao, just tell us what do you see as the main obstacles that women Thank entrepreneurs you. are facing in the region? And, uh, you know, and also maybe from your perspective, you know, we haven't talked about COVID-19. Ambassador mentioned, you know, COVID-19. Uh, tell us whether COVID-19 has made things more difficult or it has also opened up opportunities for women. We would like to hear your opinion on this. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to say, Good morning to everyone in Geneva and particularly to those students in the e, e master class. I wish I could be one of you to learn from you. 
And also there is a very good opportunity for me to um, connect with you at the uh, UNTAD and also Vanessa at the ITC. I hope that uh, after this conversation, I could take the conversation offline uh, related to the connect connectivity between your office and VCCI, my office. Now, getting back to the question, what are the challenges for women in this business? I think there are many challenges to be a woman, period, you know, to live in this world, you know, this region. Um, um, but it is natural for us as, I mean, to be a woman, you, you face even more obstacle and, you know, to begin to be a woman, you know, it's said that women are more risk averse than men in seeking finance, completely wrong. Or women with children, uh, and care responsibility, you know, like me, myself, I have a family with two children. And it is a, the myth is that then we wouldn't have a time to lead the business. All women need more financial education than men. None of this is right. In fact, they are really, really wrong. And let me focus on one obstacle, which was already mentioned in your opening remarks. Uh, and, and also in Ambassador's remarks saying that that's the access to credit, you know, in addition to other access to digitalization, access to education. Recently at my office, BCCI, we conducted a survey of more than 10 countries throughout the country. Loan term for men owned businesses is more than 16 months. So it's almost like a, a year and a half. But the average loan term for women owned business is close to 14 months. So there's a gap of two months. It is quite significant. As we observe, we see that most lending offices in banks are men and lending committees are made up by men. And they look women from as customers from male perspective. And women are not seen by men as being good risk options. What can we do to fix this wrong perception? I think that um, it is written so clearly in so many surveys that um, Vietnamese women businesses owners want to borrow more money to invest in the company. And they typically perform badly perform on their male counterparts. So I think banks need to think differently and think beyond the traditional banking method to leverage this potential growth. For example, in many countries in the region, including Vietnam, um, collaterals, you know, such as land or homes are registered in men's name. And so therefore the bank could offer alternative to help women to meet the collateral requirements, you know, or in staff and finding better degree channels to meet the needs of women who are very poor in terms of time, you know, who typically have family and household responsibility as well as running businesses. And I strongly believe that those banks who see this opportunity to set out to help women business, uh, women entrepreneurs, they also make a good business case by helping those women. These banks help themselves because it is a really a win-win situation. Really, so we stop there because they only want to focus on one obstacle, and that is access to credit. And if we could find ways to solve this problem, it is very fundamental and transformational. Thank you very much, Atau, for raising this issue. I think this is, we have, uh, as we speak now, downstairs in this building, we have a uh, intergovernmental expert meeting, meeting on e-commerce and the digital economy. And there are about 300 to 400 people, uh, the governmental officials, regulators, the central banks, they are all connected and, and the business people are connected for this meeting. And one of the things that's coming again and again is the credit, it's the, it's the finance, you know, issues of finance. The fact that uh, women and youth entrepreneurs are being considered by traditional banks as a bad, poor risk, a high risk, endeavors that they would not look at their business uh, case. So in this uh, regard, the work that you have done on doing surveys and collecting data and making a case is so critical because if you don't have this data, it's all by uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, presenting a case study 
but if you have facts on the ground and that really helps we'll hear from sue now we it helps the governmental officials and the policy makers who are addressing these issues so thank you very much thank you so let me now <laughs> So let me now uh, go into the next session uh, about the whole collaboration between the public and the private sector. So I'm going to ask you to come first and then I will uh, um, uh, go to the other panel, panel, panel discussions. Uh, you know, you have, been, you have been a champion in Myanmar, honestly. You have done the E-Trade for readiness assessments with us and uh, and you have been a, a, a real proponent of women entrepreneurs and the youth entrepreneurs uh, in the e-commerce sphere. So we believe that Myanmar is a very good example of a country that while embracing digital transformation at the national level, and it also, you have, you have acknowledged the need to strengthen the public policy dialogue by involving the private stakeholders from the very early stages. As uh, Tao mentioned, this uh, the, the the for example the business community. How do you get them involved in making policy? So, how is this expected? This consultation process. How is it this expected to feed the national policy making process? So, can you share us the value that the government gets from the input received from private sector representatives, including women? So, you have the floor. Uh... Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to those who are in different time zone and thank you so much uh, Madam Shumika for giving me the floor. Uh, Madam Moderator, uh, to your questions regarding about the consultation process, uh, I would like to uh, go back to three years back uh, when we started working with UNTEC for E-Trade Readiness Assessment. At that time we are just an infant and then uh, uh, we, we are uh, trying to improve our consultation process since that last time. So uh, for the consultation process, uh, even we had some initiative uh, before, since we contacted this E-Trade Readiness Assessment Report in late 2017 and official launch in 2018 in Geneva, uh, we did recognize the importance of uh, public-private dialogue in policymaking process. So uh, uh, uniquely, we use the four-step approach in the consultation process. So firstly, uh, from the public-private dialogue, uh, we identify bottlenecks, opportunities, and uh, possible intervention for private sector development. So in other, in other words, we identify the problems and, and understand the issues. So second, uh, we equip our officials with necessary knowledge and information for them to be able to participate uh, meaningfully in the dialogue and being able to respond to queries and questions on the spot. This is our second step. So as a third step uh, is a priorities identification. So uh, usually we receive a lot of issues and problems in our dialogue process. So among these uh, problems and issues, we have to identify the priorities. So we review the progress of each dialogue and get proposals from other line ministries and uh, private sectors. So at, at the last steps, we find the financial sources uh, to implement uh, the, our issues. And it can be from government budget or maybe from the uh, government partners. So from the dialogue, uh, we understand that uh, MSMEs are constrained by a number of challenges uh, put within and beyond their country. And we found that uh, there are so many things to be addressed by our government as a policymaker, like improving the regulatory framework, improving digital entrepreneurship, uh, and promoting gender empowerment and access to finance and incentive platforms, statistics, digital financial inclusion, meaningless rules for cross border etc. So these are the problems uh, we found in our dialogues. So based on the dialogue, uh, we could strengthen uh, our public uh, sector's role in both policy setting and building an enabling business environment, uh, which is uh, critical for e-commerce MSMEs and which is operating mainly at micro and uh, miso level as a policy and in uh, legal eyes. So we could build a collaborative and team-based approach for the uh, public sector approach. Uh, it is still not perfect, uh, honestly, but we are trying to be uh, uh, better. 
So nowadays, for event, uh, for every event we organize, one of the initiatives I mentioned before is like e-commerce strategy guidelines, uh, public-private dialogues. Uh, we are lucky to be count on uh, public sector participations, including many women uh, representatives. And by and sometimes contribution at see recently uh, with the e-commerce strategy uh, with the support of Contact and uh, our good work with our Australian government for uh, e the good practice guides. So uh, and we cannot leave the private sectors behind in our national policy making process. So uh, more formal process for uh, uh, industry engagement nowadays, comparing with last three years back when we started working with UNTEC for retrain training assessment. Um, they are now more frequent, open and transparent, and more team focused discussions. So we are improving comparing with the last three years back. So uh, with my experience in last month with UNTEC team in formulating e-commerce strategies, so we value all the inputs. Uh, provided by private sector. We are very active and then um, provide inputs. Even some of the participants, they uh, they join all the meetings, you know, five days, uh, five consecutive days. So we align with the, we align their, their proposal with the international and regional commitments and identify the priorities. So uh, that's why uh, if we see the NAMA Digital Economy Development Plan, uh, there are several indicative actions demanded by our dialogue partners which are contributing to the digital transformation and digital trade. Sometimes things take time to change, uh, but we are on the right track. So in Myanmar, we say nothing is easy, but everything possible. So Madam Moderator, I hope my answers meet your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you so much for bringing aspect uh, to light. And uh, what we also have seen in our own work doing this diagnostic analysis of e-trade readiness and also helping countries to develop their e-commerce strategies is when you bring the private sector and other you know, all governmental agencies to the room in one go. And when you have a champion and things start moving and that is what we have seen and we have great hopes for Myanmar and looking forward to working with you as we you as you uh, build the e-commerce strategy for Myanmar. So now I'm going to bring Helianti. Helianti, please tell Sue and others, the policy makers, because we are now talking about policy and what needs to be done from a digital entrepreneur's viewpoint. What do you want from government? What are you the key, key priorities? Some, some we already heard. We heard the scales in, because the ecosystem development is so key. But, you know, in, in, in many countries, the governments are also, uh, you know, they are strapped for finance. Huh? It's not just the e-commerce, but there are so many other areas that they need to fund. They need to give vaccines to kids. They need to get uh, primary schools running. Uh, uh, and, and among all that, they need to have the economic activities also being uh, built. So in your yeah, opinion, yeah. Helianti, what should the what are the main priorities of government should be as they prepare their workforces and the entrepreneurs for the digital world? Okay, so if I may uh, give comments on what's going on right now, everything is so confusing. Everybody wants to do things. So if you go to every ministry, then everybody's talking about digital. And sometimes you can see overlapping between one initiative to another initiative. And I think that's why the government budget is spread thinly because everybody keep repeating the same thing rather than join forces and doing a more complementary, um, say, if we can have like a one stop hub uh, for the digital transformation, either it's for women or for, uh, you know, something for more general, because when we're talking about infrastructure, lack of access to telecommunication, which allow rural area. Uh, to access and to uh, to benefit from the digital economy, whether it's women or men entrepreneurs, they still, you know, um, um, facing the same problems. So I think uh, first is my comments. Uh, first is that everybody is having an overlapping and sometimes it's not complementing. It's, um, it's just doing the same thing. And second is more, it's so much project basis. And then once the project gone and then you know, that's it. And my criticism with the project basis is that in many times there are so limited uh, beneficiary because the project is setting out, okay, this is the number of the beneficiary that you are servicing, right? Um, that's it. 
And then how about those others that are not touched by the program? So I think we need something, a more permanent hub ecosystem that, you know, uh, so that anybody like me, when I started the journey, I was like, okay, consultant, which consultant should I get? Whether this is too expensive, is there, is there anyone that is cheaper than that? You know, and whether it's curated, um, I don't even know which consultant I should go to. And then if I want to um, uh, onboard uh, or outsource my social media marketing, there are so many, you know, suppliers or there are so many vendors out there. Which one should I, you know, choose? What is the criteria of choosing it? What is the KPI? So I think I'm only one of so many others who are repeating the same mistakes, who has gone through a journey which are not efficient at all, which actually if all this information is provided in one single platform, it's easier. Just like, for example, take an example of say, um, uh, travel uh, platforms, marketing marketplace, say either it's Traveloka or whatever, there are so many out there. People can, can find which lodging uh, or accommodation or hotels, people can find which restaurants, people can find, and then there are review on that, you see? So basically, it's easier for those who want to do travel to choose based on the review, based on the ranking and things like that. So the similar platform is actually can be provided by the government uh, of providing this hub um, of the digital transformation. And then everybody is providing the service, can lock themselves into there, can post themselves there, and then let the market review their performance. For example, now I have to change a vendor twice. Uh, for our social media. The last one, I'm really happy. So how, is there any platform where can I can put and give recommendation to this uh, social media vendor? Which I'm very pleased with their work. You know, so this kind of things are, because everything is more project basis, but we're not allowing the market to participate in the hub, uh, in the ecosystem. We need to allow the market to be participating in doing the review, the ranking, uh, providing the services. Not all the services need to be provided by the government, but the government needs to provide a platform, an ecosystem platform where everybody providing, where all the stakeholders can link themselves to that platform. So that's that's what I think. Thank you, Helianti. This is a brilliant idea. In fact, I think what we also see is because the digital is the fashion right now, you walk into many and agencies, you know, everybody's into something to do with digital without really having a connection. So this having this one stop hub basically to provide the ecosystem for entrepreneurs is, is, a, is a brilliant idea. And I hope that you all uh, the participants who are listening into this conversation will take this, uh, you know, very seriously and take it forward to your, your, your governmental agencies. And here I want to uh, let you know that those who have done e-commerce strategies and uh, diagnostics, e-trade readiness assessments with Antad and our partners, what we do is we bring all the parties who are in the ecosystem of uh, e-commerce into one room, which itself is a big thing, not just to doing the diagnostic. So we bring the, all the ministries, the trade, the ICT ministries, the post officers, the central bank, because they need to be in the e-payment systems and uh, uh, ICT ministries, the plus the, the, the providers, the logistics logistic providers into one room. And I think that ecosystem that you create, the basic e-commerce facilitation committee, national committee should be kept alive. I think by doing that, you will probably, hopefully, will reduce the uh, overlap that you talked about. And this is an extremely important issue. So here I would like to uh, bring Tao back you again uh, to, to see uh, whether Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam, how have you tackled these issues of, you know, spread thin uh, the, the systems, the governmental systems, how have you tackled and how you, when you provide services to your uh, clientele, how do you see that this, the creating these networks, bringing uh, all into one place as helping female entrepreneurs? Hello, thank you for the question. And it was really great to hear Ms. Himan to share the experience from Indonesia. 
which is quite universal, I would say. I feel as if the sea was talking exactly about my country. Every ministry, same thing, and you know, overlapping and all that. And then there's a need for a platform, everybody connect to that. Yes, indeed. So at VCCI, uh, we are the national voice of the business in Vietnam. We try to make business to work everywhere for everyone, every day. Um, and within VCCI, we even have a, what is called Vietnam National Council of Women Businesses, Women Entrepreneurs. And it is to really strengthen the voice of female entrepreneurs. You know, they often say nothing about us is without us. Nothing about women is without women. Uh, so they are really active. So in our very limited capacity, uh, we try to put women in a less, uh, in a less disadvantaged position. You know, to allow them to lean in, to allow them to sit in the middle of the table. And for example, something as simple as whenever we organize an event, you know, and oftentimes when we organize events, it's all about businesses, uh, entrepreneurship. We try to make sure in ways that we can to include women in the panel. Sometimes if you don't think about it, you often end up with a, end up with a panels and that's really wrong. Um, and I just mentioned earlier that uh, we make conscious effort to organize large scale survey of what can business collect in order to collect, uh, data that is, you know, sex uh, disaggregate data um, so that we can have a, a very uh, gender sensitive picture of businesses in Vietnam and of women-owned businesses in particular. And we really see ourselves, VCCI, Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry, as a bridge to connect the business community and the government. And the government also see the role that we have quite unique because they, they are the one who set policies, we don't, but they really are in need. You know, they, they don't have enough forums and, and venues to interact with businesses to know whether the policies are good enough or, you know, it's nonsense. And business also need that connection. So, and we as Vietnam developing its way into prosperity and rule of law, we really believe in the role of laws and rules and regulation. You can say all you want, but if it's not written in the law, if it's not appropriated budget to make it happen, then there's no enforcement. So yes, we still have a lot of room for for implementation, execution, but I think we're on the right track. And VCCI um, role has been strengthened over the years, and so as with the private sector in Vietnam, as we become stronger, the role of VCCI sometimes is a pioneer leading the private sector. Sometimes we go hand in hand with them. Sometimes we go behind them a little bit. So, and I really strongly call for women and particularly women business, uh, entrepreneurs to come together and join VCCI because we do a lot of events, not only for general events, but also for women specific events. Uh, for example, in the upcoming ASEAN Chairmanship in November, we have an event for ASEAN Women Entrepreneurs Summit. Again, it is dedicated specifically to women entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tao. I think uh, this surveys that you have done and to collating gender sensitive data I think it's an extremely, extremely important initiative because there at least you are bringing the business side together to make a case to governments. And I think this, this, this uh, hoping for less duplication and having a one-stop one hub, I don't know, ecosystem, the feeding the needs of uh, entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs, the, the, um, uh, the, the small, medium enterprises, to this process through your service would be uh, this is very very valuable and please you know if you have if you think it is worthwhile sharing with us uh, your service and the results and this is something that we do we also take good practices from across the world to the you know to to developing countries so this is something that you know we i would like to promise you to take your experience to the rest of the world
So now, can I bring you, Sue, back again? And if you could talk to this whole uh, governmental, anyway, I think this is a big question for you. I mean, this is not your responsibility, but I think we like to hear from you because you have the experience, I mean, really being a champion in your country to bring e-commerce from the Ministry of Commerce and, and what, what steps uh, uh, what steps are taken by the Myanmar government, for example, to reduce duplication and to provide like a one-stop hub, an ecosystem for entrepreneurs? Or are you thinking of this sort of uh, uh, initiative? Uh, so you have the floor. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator, for the questions. Uh, for the, this one-stop, uh, one-stop help uh, uh, in two in two in 2018, uh, government uh, we established the Digital Economy Development Committee, uh, DEDC, led by the by Vice President. So, and uh, this uh, committee, we have set committee for the Digital Trade and E-Commerce Committee. So, everything uh, we work, every policy uh, we set up for the digital trade and e-commerce, we work under this committee, this committee led by our deputy minister. So uh, every policy consultations like uh, uh, the strategy and the MSTP, uh, the, uh, how to say, the roadmap for DEDC action metric and uh, e-commerce formulation, we work under this platform. So by doing this, we can reduce uh, the duplications and then uh, this is like uh, only one and uh, one umbrella. So we can bring all the entrepreneurs uh, under this umbrella. Uh, we discuss the issues and then uh, we go for the indicated action plans. So by doing this, we can reduce even in the duplication of platforms and uh, several recommendation process. We are now drafting the uh, e-commerce guidelines. Uh, which is a kind of interpretative. Uh, 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 we can we can we would like to uh, how to say promote the predictability of the business environment. So now we are drafting the e-commerce guideline. So and uh, this uh, this guideline uh, we have this kind of description to reduce the duplications of the process by the government. So uh, this 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 way we are trying to uh, create the more inclusive uh, environment uh, for the ecosystems. So uh, I, I think in my experience of uh, this having discussion with the, uh, for the e-commerce strategy, so uh, I think uh, so most of the, the some, uh, some private sectors, they suggested to develop this kind of, uh, this, this kind of uh, how to say, uh, the uh, a single platform. For for the recommendations, uh, for how to say the dispute and other recommendations to the government. So uh, this kind of action, we uh, actually we have in in, in the CERP action plans, and then uh, we are trying to do this kind of. But you know, uh, on the other hand, we want, we need to uh, advocate or we can we need to uh, educate our uh, counterpart from different ministries and agency. So now, uh, as a minister of commerce, as a pro promoter and facilitator for uh, e-commerce and uh, digital trade in our country, uh, we. Are giving the training to uh, government officials from many departments. Uh, so uh, last two months ago, I think we uh, uh, we, we did the training uh, with the support of area with the funded by the Australian government uh, for seven weeks training. In this training, seven seventy percent are women. So uh, so we, we have a lot of women in our government representatives. So uh, by this doing, you know, we, we need to educate uh, our private and public sector as well for the uh, sound uh, regulatory uh, frameworks. And then by doing this, we are do learning by doing to improve our ecosystem. By doing this, I, I believe that we can reduce this kind of duplication. And then maybe in next month we have one more training uh, with area for women and e-trade. So, so because now uh, if you may see in the MFS, MSDP we have a room for the uh, women. So, but in the DEDC roadmap we we don't have any specific action plan for the women. So now in the e-commerce strategy we are now discussing with the contact team to have a separate action plan for the women. So this is uh, how we are trying during this. Uh, short uh, one or two years. So this is how we are trying to duplicate at the government policy makers. We we uh, we do notice that we 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 did uh, several duplication in the past. 
So even in the mandate, uh, I mean, we are not showing, uh, sure the division of labor between among the ministries. So by doing this, we, we are giving the training. So that's by doing this, we, we know uh, what we should we do. Do we, are we the policy makers or are we the facilitators? We, we know uh, what we should do uh, in the policy making process. This is what I do now. So thank you, Ms. Wang. Thank you, Sue. Thank you so much for uh, showcasing how the government also uh, is thinking about, you know, bringing all the parties together and providing services uh, in, in one place. I think these are very good uh, initiatives. And I also must say, uh, this is Southeast Asia. You know how it is. You, um, since I have lived there, I know you look around for other countries and you see somebody running uh, further ahead of you and the others are going to touch up. So I think there is a competition built in uh, in, uh, in the region and that will uh, work uh, for uh, the region and you know hopefully for women entrepreneurs too. So now we are coming to the last part of our uh, conversation because I think the last 15 minutes we should have the questions and answer session. But before we go, Vanessa, if you can ask uh, if I could invite you to come and then I will give uh, Helianthi to say the last word and then we open up for the Q&A session. Uh, uh, Vanessa, there was a lot of discussion about funding issues and that this is a real critical issue, uh, especially for women entrepreneurs. And I think Helianthi also raised this issue about the project-based assistance. You know, then we are, we are there, we are there for a short period of time. We, uh, you know, provide assistance to a certain project and then we move on, you know, the governments, the international players. How do you handle these things in your own work, especially you know doing this amazing work with the she trade? I think um, it, it's just it's not a surprise that we've talked a lot about access to finance in this session. Um, in fact, in uh, some of the surveys that we did uh, during the height of the pandemic and all through up to July, access to finance again was the top uh, challenge. Um, you know, cash flow constraints was, was the top challenge that women entrepreneurs uh, reported facing. And we see um, that, you know, the pandemic has created an additional set of risks for women. So what we did earlier this year is we launched um, an impact fund. Um, and the idea is really to push um, the boundaries on gender lens investing. Um, the fund is 17, this care sheet, we call it the Care Sheet Trades Fund. Um, it's a $75 million uh, debt and equity fund. Um, $15 million is a first loss, which comes from public and philanthropic donors, so governments and so on, um, which is there to catalyze 60 million from private investors and so for every um this is why it's so unique for every dollar of public funding invested this dollar de-risks um the investment and appetizes private investors um to bring in an additional two and a half uh dollars of private capital. Secondly, um, we're combining um, the investment with technical assistance, in further enhancing the attractiveness of the investee companies. Third, um, our ambition is really to go from counting women, so how many women invested in, to value women. So we apply a really robust impact assessment framework for each investment made. And the idea is to focus on the impact of creating dignified um, work environments, uh, increasing gender equality in the workplace, improving access to life and housing goods for women, increasing business opportunities for, for women. And um, we do this by investing in businesses with female employees, female consumers, or of course, uh, female owners um, and focusing on helping these businesses scale as a new model beyond a traditional um, bank finance, which is often, you know, traditional finances often view startups or smaller businesses as 
and more high risk. So we're, we're really looking at de-risking this through the first loss as well as through um, technical assistance. Um, and we've put we've been able to do this because we've come together. You know, we've talked a lot about partnerships and um, really, you know, spanning as the E-Trade Umtad's E-Trade initiative does. You know, spanning the private sector as well as the public sector. So we've come together with Care, which is an international NGO. Uh, us as an international organization, and then um, a private sector player, which is the fund manager at Bamboo Capital Partners, to bring together this um, kind of social justice lens of care, ITC's trade and competitiveness lens, um, as well as a strong network, and then of course um, Bamboo Capital's uh, long track record in impact investing. And we're really excited, it's focusing in the region, in Cambodia, Philippines, uh, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam and Bangladesh. And we're doing this because we see a really big opportunity in, in this region, both because surprisingly it's actually one of the regions which has a very low um, uh, investment from impact investors, even compared to regions like Africa. So we see this big opportunity. Um, we also see a huge pipeline of potential investee companies in this region. Um, and this is why we decided to uh, focus this effort on uh, South and Southeast Asia. So I stop there. Thank you very much. And please, I'm asking also all the participants out there, please check out ITC's Impact Fund for She Trade. You have just recently launched this fund, uh, and there will be information on ITC's website. And I think this is an important uh, endeavor. Uh, you know, as you said, the traditional banking sector, I think as many of the power you mentioned too, the traditional banking se sector may not be the the best avenue for for startups uh, to go. So the extremely important to have impact funds. So Helianti, can I please bring you here to? I think I also would like to talk a bit about the COVID nineteen pandemic because we also heard how COVID nineteen have kind of has fast forward things that we thought that would take uh, many years to happen. So how has your business been affected by COVID nineteen? And do you see uh, 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 business, you know, is it good for the digital uh, space, the businesses in digital space? How, what do you expect in the coming months? Yeah, uh, first is uh, looking back, reflecting from our journey from March, since we get the lockdown. Um, actually, we benefited because we started the digital transformation in 2009. So we are partially ready, actually. The only thing that COVID uh, is a blessing in disguise is that it uh, drive our team to speed up the whole process uh, in going digital, especially in terms of accessing the market. So uh, on the on the e-commerce, we, we saw 300% um, increase uh, compared to before uh, COVID. Uh, so I think it's it's really good. Um, and uh, in overall, actually, we're quite surprised that uh, even our overall uh, demand, especially from export market, is also uh, increasing. And what I like is that now all trade show, the important trade show uh, international, they also going online, uh, virtual. It drops our cost significantly because if you have to fly out and you know have the physical booth and everything it costs you so much and now we can it's like with our existing budget we can do four or five uh, trade show rather than one trade show compared to before so i think that's that's the good side um of um uh of doing uh being forced of doing uh digital uh with the um with the COVID, not for all of ourselves, but the whole uh, business ecosystem is transforming themselves into that direction. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's the, that's the beauty of it. Uh, all the cost of advertising become much more uh, efficient, uh, very uh, very targeted, uh, very easy to direct effectively to our segmentation of the market. So uh, this is. So I think this is also uh, my my uh, feedback to our uh, fellow women entrepreneurs out there. Uh, when we talk about demystifying about the digital transformation, it's not as scary as we thought. Um, it's not as difficult as we thought, but it's very important for us to have a big aim, but we start small. Uh, and 
put uh, break down our implementation into phases and allow ourselves to have a quick win on every phase that we do because it's very important not to over exhaust ourselves not to uh, being burned out with the whole digital transformation and allow uh, and by breaking it down into small uh, stages or small phases we can um, enjoy uh, quick returns so that you know it gives um, a motivation for the team as well because they don't have to wait for the major transformation to see the results Thank you, Helianti, for these inspiring words. Participants, you are out there and you know why Helianti is a e trade for all women's uh, a core, like a founding member. You see how inspiring uh, uh, her talk is. Thank you for sharing your experience and also sharing that, you know, even in these difficult times, and if you manage to demystify this whole digital war, we can do many things. And this is, this is a very, very good message. So to now to go to our uh, uh, participants, I think Viri, you must have uh, connected, collected some uh, questions. Would you like to put them to us? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Shamika. So there were a few reactions and comments as well to what the panelists have been, have been mentioning. And a few points that have resonated with our audience in particular are the fact that indeed there is a fragmentation uh, in terms of the interventions of uh, public entities. Um, and that therefore the idea of having a hub uh, for the ecosystem to connect uh, was uh, very appreciated. There was also a comment explaining that it's not just the public sector sector that needs uh, maybe some mainstreaming, but that the private sectors and private actors themselves are also fragmented. So maybe something that uh, our panelists will be able to comment on further. Um, there was also, of course, pick up on the issue of uh, finance and the need to unlock access to finance. So this also resonated with our audience. Um, and now maybe if I turn to the questions, I will only select a couple of them because for, for the sake of time. Um, <clears throat> One was how, related to the fact that SMEs and women-led SMEs in particular uh, need to access international markets. So maybe this could be a question that maybe Vanessa or Tao can, can pick up on and how uh, can we support women entrepreneurs to access international markets and maybe can the digital transformation help in this endeavor? So that would be one aspect. <laughs> Uh, another one uh, which I quite uh, liked, and I think uh, uh, maybe Ellie and other panelists can also uh, give a hint, is that how do we create role models? And these role models would be women who can support other women in this uh, journey. So I kind of liked this one in particular because this is also something that we try to support with our E-Trade for Women initiative. Um, there was also a question related to the COVID pandemic, but I think that Elise's uh, last intervention kind of covered that. So I'll stop here. Uh, and thanks again to all for sharing your comments and questions. Thank you, Vee. So if I, since we are a bit running, I think we probably have maybe 10 minutes to go. So if I can, uh, I will ask the, our panelists to start from the last one. So Tao, please, and then followed by Sue, Vanessa, and then Helianti, and then Julia, if you could take up some of these issues and maybe say a few things, maybe in two minutes, uh, that would be great. So Tao, can I start with you? Um, so I have a question of, uh, to uh, women-owned businesses have access to from ECCI, we don't think we've got a two-year program to support small and medium enterprises. Women-owned business, also ethnic minority-owned businesses, and we include market studies, um, export development plan. Um, and also, obviously, connecting business to business. So uh, we're going to do a survey to select uh, what type of businesses won't be qualified for our support because we can't support everyone, uh, but we certainly give uh, extra weight to support women businesses and ethnic minority owned businesses. Uh, last, uh, last but not least, I just want to touch very quickly on the issue of COVID because I cannot not about it. Vietnam is a success story 
the world over how we deal and combat with COVID-19. And uh, but recently, the UNDP in Vietnam, together with the UN Women, conducted a survey of the impact of COVID on um, on, on businesses, and particularly small and medium uh, businesses. And these are two findings that I would like to share with you. One, it says that women-led small and medium enterprises suffer the greater reduction in terms of revenue. So it means that. For women-owned businesses, they, their level of revenue is only 17%, one seven of last year. But for men, it is higher. So that's one thing. But more interestingly, women-owned businesses tend to keep their workers, especially female workers, during the challenging times. What does it tell you? It tells you that women-owned businesses have a stronger sense of social responsibility and solidarity than men-owned businesses. It's a very interesting fact that we need to keep in mind in terms of policy making and supporting women owned businesses. So thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this conversation. I learned a lot from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Tao. These are very, very important points. Uh, please also share the, I, I, I'm an economist, huh? so I, I love numbers. So please share the results from your survey that you mentioned about COVID impact on of COVID because we can also uh, refer to this. Sue, can I ask you to now take the floor? Thank you so much. So uh, in the question, I'd like to touch upon the two points. For the, the first one is the fragmented the private sectors and the second one is uh, a few information about the response by Myanmar government. So for the fragment that uh, in the private sector, what we did in the last two years is uh, we encourage the private sector to form the associations. And during these two years, uh, we created two associations related to the e-commerce. Uh, the, the, the one association, e-commerce association, uh, they are uh, come with the, uh, the e player from the, from the different uh, industries. So uh, now the other association is Digital Economy Association. So this is uh, more broadly work for the digital economy science. So this is by doing this, we can uh, reduce the fragmentation uh, among the private sectors. And then uh, our policy dialogue is more focused. And then uh, we can uh, discuss on the same uh, visions and then uh, same goal. So this is a first comment for the fragmented. And the other questions about the entrepreneurship, I think I'm not the right person to give the comments uh, for these questions. And the last information about our government response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, in uh, April, government uh, introduced the COVID-19 economy relief plan CRP. Uh, in this plan, uh, digital innovation and platforms are one of the key uh, goals of our economic recovery post covid so Government created a COVID-19 fund of uh, uh, 200 billion uh, for the venerable SMEs, uh, which has most adverse impacted. So in the CRP, uh, we have intermediate and short-term actions uh, to implement uh, before year end. So uh, based on this uh, action plans, uh, what we are doing right now is we are going to launch our e-commerce guideline, which I mentioned before, uh, to enhance trust between the operators and then consumers uh, to develop e-commerce together uh, with the registration system. We will also introduce our e-commerce registration systems. And the second thing is we are uh, uh, now doing the Innovation Challenge Grant for e-commerce, uh, which is one of the action plans of CERP, and we will start very soon with the support of UNDP Myanmar. So in this challenge grant, uh, we have four different themes. Uh, the first thing is about uh, SM, uh, COVID recovery. The second one is uh, our SME formalization. Uh, the third one is we went and e trade, which is very relevant with our today topic. And the, the last one is the uh, online consumer. Uh, online uh, intellectual property rights uh, uh, protection. So this is the fourth thing we, are, we will work and our innovation challenge grant. So uh, the last one is with the support of Australian government, uh, we are now developing the good practice guides uh, on moving in Myanmar in four key sectors, the grocery, food, uh, consumer, and transportation, 
uh, which are the sectors uh, most impacted by the COVID-19 uh, with the support of our leading Myanmar uh, marketplace and service provider. So, and we will follow up actions to support the transition are now being discussed with the uh, different uh, several donors. So these are the same initiatives we are providing to the uh, private sector during the COVID. And uh, some of the actions, uh, for instance, the actions to promote delivery sectors uh, in the pipeline are uh, waiting for the approval to step. So I think uh, we, we can work more in the near future. So this is one of the opportunities during the challenges because of the COVID. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. And thank you so much for inviting me to participate in, in this important dialogue. Thank you, Sue. Please also give my regards to the Deputy Minister, who is also, you know, who is a real champion in Myanmar, you know, Deputy Minister for Trade, to, uh, you know, working with you to take forward the initiatives. So, Vanessa, I, 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 could I please give you the floor for your two minutes uh, response? Uh, Shamika, two minutes is even long for me because I'm going to give you um, a, a simple formula at She Trades, which contains three ingredients and I'm going to focus on the question uh, given the time on how we can support women access markets. So our three ingredients are number one on the business. So we focus on women owned businesses, um, firstly improving their competitiveness and digital transformation is a huge and a uh, crucial part for all our companies in every single sector, uh, as well as, you know, product development, creating a unique selling point. And there we are, are increasingly encouraging our businesses to look at sustainability as a unique selling point. So um, environmentally friendly um, or in innovations, as it were, um, and then transitioning online. So to selling online and to connecting online. So this is number one on the business. The second ingredient in our formula is on the markets. So um, we focus a lot on, and, and I think a lot of agencies and government entities and trade promotion organizations and so on, should focus a lot on cultivating the market, really providing access to buyers, because how does a single you know, smaller company actually access some of the most lucrative markets, and that's by having a broker and, a, and, a, and an advocate for them in linking them to those markets. Then the third um, ingredient, and I think you mentioned it, Shamika, earlier on in the conversation, was the ecosystem. So we also work on the policy and institutional ecosystem to ensure that it provides an enabling environment for the companies that we work. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Let me now, uh, Helianti, I, I would want to give you the last uh, 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 word. So let me, uh, if Julia is still connected to us, Julia, please uh, take the floor because you have an overarching view of the ASEAN region. Thank you very much, Shamika. Uh, let me maybe continue what Vanessa just said. I think the word ecosystem is a key word because we are talking about a shared responsibility. So all actors in innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem have a role to play. And I'm talking about, of course, policymakers and governmental agency, they have a role to play. Education institutions have a role to play. The business sector, both multinational enterprises, small micro firm startups have a role to play. And then let me also quickly address the other question about uh, future trends, uh, uh, economic trends. It's very difficult to make predictions. We live very uncertain times. But I go back to the original point uh, made at the beginning. This is an economic issue. Uh, it's very likely that uh, many jobs will be destroyed by the pandemic. Many new jobs will be created, most likely linked to the digital economy. So if we don't have women you know, into the picture, we will have less businesses, less startups, less innovation, and less wealth. So uh, these are my points. Thank you very much, Shamika. Thank you, Julia, for bringing these important points to bear as we, uh, as we are getting to the closing of the session. So, Helianti, could I please invite you? You are the e, our E-Trade for Women advocate, and you have played a big role in the success of this E-Trade for Women masterclass that we are ending today with this session. You have the floor. 
Yes. Um, so basically, when we're talking about the um, ecosystem, it's always starting with the individu individuals who are willing to give commitment uh, to support the ecosystem to work. Uh, and I think it's a matter of we need to have a platform where people probably like me, who are, you know, happily to set aside, say, two, three hours a month uh, to share our experiences. Um, I, I'm sure that there are so many people out there. So that's why even when we're doing this event, it has been very easy for me to reach out, for example, to Karen Lam, uh, which is the ex-journalist of uh, Channel News Asia, to support because I think we realize that if we want to go far, we need to collaborate. We need to support each other, and we need to um, give um, give back in terms of at least the timing and the and the experience that you have. Is now the question is what will be the platform that we're going to use uh, so that people out there, not only in Indonesia but probably in Asia or even um, around the world, to be able to access each other. So. Um, so again, for all of those who are embarking in the journey, um, don't be afraid. Just you know, uh, just work on it, and um, don't uh, don't be shy to ask help because basically we cannot do it ourselves. And I'm sure that there are many out there people that are willing to support. That's all from me, Shamika. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helianti. I think you you basically said the last word for this session. If we want to go far, we need to work together. Uh, thank you for very much, everyone, for uh, being here with us uh, for the last uh, one and a half hours. And here I am going to say goodbye to you. I'm not going to uh, start summarizing. Actually, I am also inspired. I don't have an e-commerce business. I'm even thinking now, maybe you need to start something. So I, I really hope that this dialogue offered you some interesting insights into this world of digital space. And let me assure you at Antar, we are here for you. We are ready to help you in your journey. So thank you everyone. And we uh, let's be connected and plan, uh, stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.